In fact, this is this is urgent in my opinion because people are being. This is a bunch of fear mongering. People are being scared. Even people that feel good on carnivore, they're yes. being scared that they're going to that they need to start introducing carbs back in because then you know they never experience symptoms. They they had they felt the greatest that they that they felt in in their whole life in some cases mm-hmm. that they can't even remember feeling. And then they see a video like that and they go, oh well, maybe I should get my bloods tested then. Maybe I should go. And then they'll look at their HbA1c, they'll look at their fasting glucose, and go, oh well, that's a little higher than oh, it's turning towards the higher range. Maybe I should get that lower by adding carbs in. Which, I mean, first of all, on the surface, it sounds paradoxical. I'm not going to pretend like you can't do that because insulin, glucagon, they all have regulations. They they all influence those values sometimes in a paradoxical fashion. The question becomes whether you should be doing that. You're looking at a blood test outside of the overall context of the system while completely ignoring the fact, forgetting you feel better than you ever have. And perhaps in the situations where you felt a lot worse, your fasting glucose and HbA1c were in range, in range. And this, yeah. is the, this, this is the whole problem with like, people forget the Hippocratic oath. They, they completely forget it. It's, if a patient is presenting with no symptoms of any kind and no identifiable disease process, because it is true that just because you don't develop, you don't have, you don't experience symptoms, it doesn't mean there isn't something lurking underneath. But if there's nothing there, nothing, then you are not only not, you are not only obligated to not intervene. If you yourself notice that in yourself, there's no reason to get a blood test done. Like there's nothing, there's there's no reason to change your diet around at least. There's no reason to do that based on a bunch of arbitrary metrics that are based on data from clinics with a bunch of with a demographic of people that are sick because who goes to the clinics it's it's a bunch of people that are sick and the very rare people that are like oh got to go get my yearly checkup yeah, and it, it, i mean th- this is this is what the data is based on and we're ext- extrapolating that to people that are not experiencing symptoms and for the people that are experiencing symptoms this is where i actually wanted the conversation to go because it's not to say that people don't exhibit they can't exhibit symptoms when they're introducing a carnivore diet into their into their bodies after years of not eating it. Uh, it's not to say that people can't experience weight loss stalling or poor thyroid function. So I wanted to ask you, I have my opinions on this and I've made them very clear um, in public in my in my rhetoric um, in the space. but I want to get your opinions on at least some of these. So we talked about HBA1C, you've given your opinions and, and really it wasn't even that much opinion. it was just fact. What you just yeah, gave was yeah, fact. Yeah, fact. Yes. <laughs> they're, they're just absolute facts that we are ignoring a bunch of nuance that needs to be considered. Mm, yep. But what about fasting glucose? So have you seen in, in, cl- in your own clients, have you seen increases in fasting glucose? What is the highest that you have seen? Has it actually been indicative necessarily of a problem? You know, let's go, let's get into that. Right. Okay. Well, again, you see people are falling into the trap of, oh, 105 milligrams per deciliter. That's high. No, that's not high at all. So the studies are there. I've got that in my hematology um, pack of 10 years of blood testing. I know this inside out, back to front. So 130 milligrams per deciliter will elicit an insulin response. And people go, oh, I thought insulin responded to glucose. First of all, yeah, Doug, you have what's called a basal level of yep. insulin. And it is not affected in any way, shape, or form. It's just pulsatile. It's in the system. And if your blood glucose is 80, 90, 100, 105, 110, 120, 130, even the American Diabetes Association will back this up. And there are studies for this. Nothing's going to happen to your insulin response. Once it's over 130, then you get an insulin response. So when you're looking at fasted glucose and you're fat adapted, and that's really crucial, it will go up. Because there is a certain amount of glucose that's required in the body, mainly for red blood cells. We're making 2.5 million red blood cells every single second. And we're recycling 2.5 million every single second, and they rely on glucose. People say, oh, you, you don't need that much glucose, really. Well, you do for red blood cells. They, they need it. Okay, so that's where your gluconeogenesis is coming from. Most of it, yeah, yeah. Lactate yeah, from the, yeah. a re- yes, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Nice, a, wonder, a wonderful recycled system. Mm-hmm. So when you're fasting glucose goes up and that yeah i've definitely seen that um that's because you're fat adapted so the cell is replete with fatty acids where's that glucose going to reside well it's not it's not actually going to go into your fat stores it's going to be in your bloodstream because up to up to 130 milligrams per deciliter that's easy that's okay it's not a problem when we're talking about the volume what does that actually mean 130 milligrams per deciliter and uh, i've I'll tell you how crazy all this stuff is, because we look at just having 50 grams of carbs, the difference it makes. 
when you're up to there, that's pretty good. That's cool. You're getting no big biphasic response from the uh, pancreas from the beta cells. That's, that's okay. Right. Fasting glucose will go up because the bloodstream is still putting the glucose residing there. Nowhere else. It's not going anywhere else. Because the very, the very reason is because there is not an insulin response. That's right. the whole point. Exactly. You know, so yep. there we go. So the GLUT2 um, transporters are fired up and doing what they need to do, which doesn't need insulin, and the body is being homeostatically controlled. Right. You know, and this ridiculous stuff. Of, anyway, well, yeah, I've answered your question. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I was going to say the whole, the, the 130 milligram per deciliter figure is actually taught in biochemistry classes for clinical yes. significance. You're actually taught that. Yes. I learned this years ago when taking it. Years yeah. ago. And 180, and 180 milligrams per deciliter is when the kidney will start putting sugar in the urine. We know that. Yeah. That's seen time and time again. Now, also, the proviso here is this is based on what you just said, the population that eats 45 to 65% carbohydrates. Yeah. I think those barriers are actually going to be higher. If we could do studies on carnivores, and we could do the studies to see, oh, hey, when does when does uh, when do we start getting the big insulin response or biphasic response? I think it would be higher. But I have no proof of that. But what the proof we do have keeps people in the right limits. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's that's always the problem with with the area of nutrition science in the first place, and not even just nutrition science, but all of medical science. You're 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 studying populations that have completely different phenotypes from people like us. We're the abnormal in this situation. We, we, we are abnormal. It, it, it's a sad fact that we're abnormal, but we are abnormal. The normal people are the ones that, yes, as you said, they're eating carbohydrates every single day, regularly. And so their figures, I mean, even if you find the average amount, like 180 milligrams per deciliter is where you know, sugar is starting to get put into the urine because it's actually toxic, to the extremely toxic. You're, you're getting to an extremely toxic level. Um, Plus or minus a very small standard deviation in the samples that you're studying. Well, I mean that could that that signal that mean could very well change, even perhaps lower or upward, depending you know, depends on the circumstances in a carnivorous population or a, a diet or a population of people eating a carnivorous diet. So all of those figures can change, but it is it is nev nevertheless yes, as we as we discuss, it's, it's an established fact that insulin it's not sort of a commensurate phenomenon. Insulin release like commensurate with the unit of glucose in the blood. You'll get a commensurate yeah. amount of insulin in the blood. Yeah. That's not exactly how that works. Yeah. Um, there's many factors at play there, and even in a standard American, that's not how that works. That's not yeah. how that works. So that's um, that, that's something that needs to be addressed as well. Because uh, of course, for the same reasons that we're covering this, people are afraid that if their fasting glucose is going up, that they're going to be that's the cause of perhaps their weight gain or weight stalling um, if they're having that, or or they're having. As it, this, this is where I actually, this is a side comment that I wanted to make, an additional comment. They think that they're experiencing higher glycation rate, which isn't necessarily the case because we already covered, you know, like when you're looking at an HbA1c value, that's even weaker of an inference. Next to that, above that would be fasting glucose. Sure. However, you have to look at the glucose regulation patterns. Like, mm -hmm. is it spiking and then trough, yep. spike, trough, spike, trough, or yep. is it a flat line like we were discussing? Now, this is a very trite point in this space, but I mean, many people, I, look, it doesn't seem like people like Zane actually understand this. So I'm going to, as you said, I'm going to, I'm going to emphasize it, but I think uh, something else that we can cover is the, is the significance uh, and the, and the utility of the fructosamine assay as well to get a better inference about this, because then you actually look at things like glycated albumin. You actually look mm. to see if your, if thing, if your tissues are being glycated at a higher rate. Um, yes. I think that a composite inference is way better here. Like if you're going to look at an HbA1c value, look at HbA1c value, continuous glucose regulation, not even just the fasting gl glucose because that's a snapshot in time. Uh, mm -hmm. So what's the regulation look like? The fructosamine assay and then retic reticulocyte production rate, all four of yeah. those. That gets a way better picture. That, that forms a way better picture. So I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I definitely. With the C-peptide, I think that's really helpful as well. Uh, and amylene, yeah. as amylene yeah. production, which is in the same vesicle. Anyway, uh, I just want to do something that just to get across averages, how misleading they are. So I have two people and they come in and they say they've got 100 milligrams per deciliter average. And then we look at their day and one person has it going up to 150, drop into 50, 150, drop into 50, up to 150. Average, 100. And now I can have somebody 105, 95, 105, 95, 105, 95. 
So you're talking about glycation. Yes, mm -hmm. the average is 100, but you can get much faster glycation rates at those peaks. Now, oh, isn't, yeah. it, isn't it crazy that th there's no joined up thinking because they're worried about the glycation rate and they're adding glucose, the very thing that causes glycation. And you're also yep. saying, maybe try 50 grams of carbohydrates. Now, theoretically, if we didn't have all these wonderful defense systems to stop it being toxic, that 50 grams is equivalent to 1,000 milligrams per deciliter. Yep. 